Well, good afternoon. Um, um, well, you, you know, this, uh, this talk used to be very current about 12 years ago. Uh, but people want to listen to the first bit in any case, for some, some reason. I suppose it's a, bit, it's a bit romantic, that bit. But let me assure you that the end keeps changing. Okay, so you have to sort of, uh, you know, be with me until we get to the end, <laughs> even if you've heard it before. Um, let's start from here. Um, schools. I uh, tried finding out uh, where schools come from, you know, who invented school, and it's actually very old. Uh, it goes back, I think, to the Phoenicians. Uh, the earliest references around 5,000 or more years ago, um, and uh, those schools were um, were pretty much similar to ours. Uh, you know, they had classes and teachers and that sort of thing. But it's not very well documented what uh, how those schools operated. Uh, the first bits of documentation comes uh, around 2,500 years ago from Greece. Um, and as many of you would uh, recall, it's Plato who documented the first bits of education. And he wrote about his professor, Socrates, who um, had a rather peculiar method. He used to take about four or five students and ask them a question. And, um, and then uh, the students would say, well, so what's the answer? And uh, Socrates would say, well, why would I ask you this question if I knew the answer? So the students were then expected to use their heads and figure out the answer by discussion. The Greek government allowed this to go on for a while, but they decided that this was sedition. This was you know, ruining young minds by making them think too much and they poisoned Socrates. So his best student, Plato, decided that uh, uh, he should not follow his professor's path because, you know, the outcome wasn't all that good. So Plato formalized the whole system a little bit and said, no, the teacher has to deliver. And he sort of formally uh, describes an academy where the teacher delivers, the learners receive. His best student, was Aristotle, and Aristotle um, went on to invent physics. Now the Greek government of 2,000 years ago said, what's all this rubbish with things falling and rising? I mean, what's that going to do for us? Why don't you take some students and teach them how to fight? So Aristotle opened an academy and produced his best student, Alexander, who then went on to win lots of wars, as you know. But for the rest of the world, they said, this is really cool. All you need are a few young people and one old man, and you get conquerors coming out of the system. <laughs> Jump ahead a thousand years, the Victorians are running the biggest and the last of the empires on this planet. Um, they have requirements like, we need 50 administrators for Mauritius and 600 soldiers for Ghana in six weeks' time. Here is the curriculum, here is a stick, and let's just do it. We want 500 identical people. The Victorians were good engineers, so they produced the perfect system for doing that. It did the job very, very well. The Industrial Revolution happened, the Americans picked up the model and said, this is perfect. We can produce identical people for our factory assembly lines. Nobody must get more than 50. Nobody must get less than 50. Everybody must get 50% in everything. The system stuck on. The industries went off to China. And here we are, left with an invincible Victorian system that produces identical products. So that's approximately a very brief history of schools. You know, students today don't particularly want to be identical to each other and uh, don't particularly like this system. So, of course, all of you are in the thick of it and you are trying to see how far we can change that system to be a little mellow. 
but then it wasn't designed to be mellow. So taking that same old system and tweaking it a bit by painting the classrooms, you know, red and blue, is uh, not going to have a particularly great impact on the system. We need some rethink. In what direction can that rethink come from? Well, I'll jump to something else. <clears throat> Skills. We, in schools, we uh, like to teach skills. Let's, let's, for example, look at some uh, critical life skills, not in 2012, but say in 1812. Um, I would imagine that riding a horse was a critical life skill, and so was uh, fighting with a sword. And those things were taught in schools. If you took a time machine and went back there and said, in 2012, we don't have these things in our curriculum, uh, the 1812 teacher would, head teacher would have said, uh, you're, you're not teaching your children basic life skills. And you would have said, no, but the world changed. And he would say, I can't believe that there will be a world where fighting with a sword will not be important. Let's take an example. You're standing in a supermarket, and you're watching the, the counters, the checkout counters, so each of these people, they take whatever you've got, scan it with a bar code reader, the price appears, the total appears, you give him some money, he feeds that amount in, the drawer opens, and it tells him how much to return. Now, if I were to ask you that by looking, can you tell how many of these people actually know arithmetic? You, I think, would agree that there's no way to tell. Some of them may and some of them may not, but they are all identical as far as their operations go. So now I'm going to ask or, or propose a, um, an obsolete skill. Could it be that arithmetic is an obsolete skill? Now this generally causes a great deal of consternation, which is why I have to tell you the, the, the original story of sword fighting. So you would react to Arithmetic is an obsolete skill, more or less like the school principal of 1812 would have reacted to if you said that sword play is going to be an obsolete skill. When skills become obsolete, it's very difficult to detect that period of obsolescence unless you watch the learner. If the learner shows a great deal of disinterest, for example, in learning the 17 times table, then you know there's something wrong. Okay, I recently was in an English school where a little girl got a prize for reciting the 17 times table. Um, I think it was a waste of a large number of brain cells. <laughs> so anybody who has a mobile phone doesn't need to learn multiplication tables. I know you're looking very grim, but I'm just proposing this. <laughs> so skills become obsolete, like other things become obsolete. What else becomes obsolete? For example, if you look at old paintings, most old paintings, you see that men, pictures of, uh, uh, paintings of men, uh, show very large biceps. Those were times when men needed to use their biceps a lot. So the biceps are big, invariably. We lost those biceps. What we got instead were thin, long fingers for typing, okay? The biceps became obsolete, nature reacted. Whenever there's a prosthetic that amplifies something that we can do, then nature tends to suppress that particular thing and put those energies elsewhere. Unfortunately, the cloud is a prosthetic for the brain. And this time we don't know what nature is going to do. Okay? Just, just leave that thought in your head for a while. I know it's horrible to think that our brains are not needed anymore, <laughs> but, but who knows? Education. Uh, let, let's try a thought experiment, which I've been trying for quite a while now with my students. Um, if you had access to Google, on a really good broadband access to Google all the time, and you pretended 
to be an accountant, how long could you, could you survive? About three years ago, people used to sort of laugh at this and say, oh, maybe a day or two and then we'll catch you out. Uh, about a year ago, they said, well, maybe you could survive for a couple of months. And then I put this question up on my Facebook page a few weeks ago, this year. And the very first response was, why do you want to know this? Most accountants today are anyway pretending using Google. Okay, so how many such professions are there where you can pretend using Google to be something that you're not? That's the first part of the problem. The second part is, if you can pretend successfully to be a professional in an area that you haven't studied, then why should you not be called a professional in that area? So if you want to take a really tough example, how long could you pretend to be a general practitioner, a doctor, if you had invisible Google under your table so your patient can't see that you're Googling? <laughs> well, uh, I used to think it would be a month, two months, until I realized that my GP in England, when he examines me, he actually does use Google. <laughs> he checks out the drugs and its interactions with other things and so on. So is Google pretending or is Google a part of the profession now? I don't know. We discussed this uh, in a slightly different context uh, earlier this afternoon, and I think, uh, I think many of the teachers who attended that did did see that there was, a, there was a, a problem there with how much of it is pretended and how much is necessary. I asked young people what they think about education and curriculum. And uh, it's not a very visible graph, so I'll describe it to you. I made two axes. On one axis, you have things that are interesting and things that are uninteresting. The other axis, you have things that are relevant and things that are irrelevant. So you now get four boxes. You ask uh, children to put things into different boxes, and this is more or less what they do. Curriculum and traditional schooling is put into the uninteresting and irrelevant category. They quite, don't quite understand why the curriculum is what, whatever it is. Examinations, surprisingly, are put into the relevant but very uninteresting category. Because I suppose they realize they have to pass it in order to, to, to you know, do something with their lives. What children find interesting and relevant are cool things, gadgets, websites, that sort of thing, which of course doesn't figure in the curriculum anywhere. There isn't a, a curriculum of gadgets, for example. And then there is one box, which is a very puzzling box. It's things that are interesting, but irrelevant. For some reason, human beings love that box. You know? Uh, it's the kind of thing we discuss in pubs. You know, for example, you might say, why did, why did human beings lose their tails? <laughs> and this would be of extreme interest in a pub conversation. We would discuss it for hours, you know? Although it's entirely irrelevant, but it's very interesting, <laughs> okay? Um, so in that box comes games and entertainment. Any form of pure entertainment, like a, uh, like a, a sci-fi novel, is usually quite interesting, but not particularly relevant. It doesn't do anything to you. We love those things. We spend hours on them. And for some reason, there are questions which we love to discuss. Questions like, what will happen if a meteorite hits the Earth? Now, everybody knows it's not going to happen in the next million years, given the probabilities. But we still love to discuss it. You know, what are the disaster scenarios that might happen? Um, what will happen if a dreadful virus comes and you know, wipes out all the men on the planet? Uh, we would you know, discuss this at great length, although it's completely irrelevant. If there was a way to move regular curriculum into the two boxes on the left, then we don't have much of a problem. So what I'm going to tell you next is that why do I come to this conclusion? 
And therefore, what, what can a teacher do? How can you take a part of the curriculum and move it into one of the other boxes? To do that, I need to go back to the beginning of my story, which is 12 years old now. And at that time, the problem was of trying to teach children to use computers, children who didn't have computers and didn't know what computers were, didn't know English, etc. It's a pretty well-known story, but uh, people like to hear it anyway. Very briefly, what I did then was to make an ATM-like structure, about three feet off the ground, connect it to the internet, and just leave it for children to use. Uh, and what we observed was that uh, within a few hours, children who ostensibly did, don't know anything at all would start to surf. And they did another very interesting thing. Not only would they surf, they would start teaching each other to surf. That seems to be something that children like to do. So when they do something, they would go and show somebody else how to do it. So I thought this was a rather inexpensive way of producing learning, which was by themselves. It took a while to convince people that this does indeed actually happen. And it took a lot of technology. Because when you put computers outdoors, which I did then in many, many different places in India, in Cambodia, in Africa, uh, you have to do a whole lot of things to keep it working. We, we solved all those problems. I won't go into the technology. Um, but what we could do at the end of it was that sitting in my office in New Delhi, I could see what was happening on any of those computers. I could read the logs over the internet. I could see what was happening on the screens, not in real time, but with a few, few minutes gap. And I could see the faces of the children who were using it. And these children are separated by thousands and thousands of miles. And then we could piece together the story of which computer was doing what and by whom. And it gave us a picture of what happens when children are exposed in unsupervised groups in front of a computer. Here's a little picture of uh, those years. <laughs> Took about five years to do this experiment. We started at uh, top of India in the Himalayas. <laughs> to the foothills. Each of our should get five Then to the desert. We were checking for environmental effects on the computer as well as how children react. Central India, these are fishing villages, very hot, very humid. This sequence is a favorite of mine. This is an eight-year-old boy telling his elder sister what to do. <laughs> the equatorial part of India. We were now using VSATs for internet connectivity. to eastern India to the rivers. <laughs> then on to South 
Africa. How do you play it? Like something. Just playing solitaire. Then to Cambodia. So five years passed and half a million children were computer literate. We measured this. And what I got was quite surprising. There's a steady upward learning curve happening independently of any adult intervention. The curve was very similar to the kind of curve we would get in control schools with teachers. There were some differences in the deviations because not all children learned everything in that unsupervised environment. In the schools, they learned more or less similar things. But other than that, the curve showed us that children would reach the levels of an office secretary, an average office secretary, in nine months on their own. So by this time, we had this conclusion that groups of children can teach themselves to use computers, uh, regardless of who they are or where they are. But it raises the next question. If they can do this, then what else could they do? So I uh, found a problem in a South Indian city called Hyderabad. The problem was that children would go to school, uh, you know, poor schools, to learn English. And they would learn English, they would learn reasonably good grammar, syntax, uh, spelling, etc. But they would not learn how to pronounce properly because they didn't have native language English speakers to teach them. So they would pick up the accents of the local teachers. And this didn't help them because when they went to apply for jobs, the South Indian accent is very strong. So, so when they would go to apply for a job, the employer would say, well, your English is good, I can, I can see that, but I can't understand a word of what you're saying. So they wouldn't get a job. I uh, put a computer into a school, in uh, one such school. Into that computer, I put in a speech-to-text uh, piece of software. So the idea was that if you speak into the computer, the computer would type whatever you said. Then I asked some children to come and speak into the computer. They came in and they spoke, and the computer typed complete nonsense. So the children laughed and said, it doesn't understand anything of what we're saying. So I said, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll leave this computer here with an internet connection for a couple of months, and you have to make yourselves understood. So the children said, but we speak the way we speak. How, how do we make ourselves understood? So I said, well, I, I don't know, actually, how you'll make yourselves understood, but uh, I mean, I'm just leaving this here for two months. <laughs> and I went off. You know, it's a good teaching method. <laughs> so I went off and uh, uh, came back in two months' time to find this little boy called Faizan standing outside the classroom, or the room where the computer was. So I asked him in English, Faizan, how are you? And Faizan said to me, fantastic. So I said, well, where is that coming from? So I went inside and found that the children had done the following. They had downloaded something called the Speaking Oxford Dictionary. If you type a word into the Speaking Oxford Dictionary, it says it out in a flat BBC kind of accent. The children would listen to that. They would uh, correct each other. And finally, when they're happy that they're saying it the same way, they would speak the word into the speech to text to check if the right word was appearing. Okay, in other words, they had invented a pedagogy. Now, this is not something that learners are supposed to do. This is what we are supposed to do. We give them the pedagogy and they follow the pedagogy. 
but in this case they had actually invented it. So I uh, thought, well, th this is rather nice that not only are they teaching themselves how to use a computer, they can then, given a problem, invent a method for solving it. Would this work elsewhere as well? Well, here's a glimpse of their practice. Good morning, Dr. Good evening. Nice to meet you. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to meet you. 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 Uh, this girl is uh, interesting. She is now about 22 or 23 years old. And it's possible that some of you may have spoken with her because she works for call center and might have overcharged you on something or the other. <laughs> <laughs> so at this stage, uh, I, I tried this conclusion out on, uh, on teachers, that groups of children can achieve educational objectives by themselves. It wasn't taken very kindly uh, because, uh, you know, people felt that this was, this was too vast a, a statement to make. Uh, and my colleagues in Newcastle University as well said, you know, isn't this too much that uh, it's one thing that they can fiddle around with a computer and play games by themselves, but it's another thing to say that they can do uh, school objectives by themselves. So I decided to test it with an experiment, and uh, the experiment was to see how far it would go. The, the research question was, can Tamil-speaking, Tamil is a South Indian language, can Tamil-speaking children in an Indian village learn the biotechnology of DNA replication in English by themselves, you know, standing under trees or whatever it is. And I thought this is a, a brilliant research question. I'll pre-test them, they'll get a zero. I'll post-test them after a few months, they'll get another zero. I'll come back to Newcastle and I'll say we need teachers. So I found a village. It's called Kali Kuppam, and it's way down south in India. Uh, Kalikupam had been hit by the Asian tsunami of 2004 and its school was destroyed. Um, we had gifted two hole-in-the-wall computers for the children to play with. So they used to play games on it. Into those computers I downloaded some material on biotechnology, DNA replication, genetics, of the internet uh, with no editing. I got two friends of mine, biotechnologists, to create two tests to test for comprehension of that material. I called some children, they were all around 12 years old, and asked them, I, I told them, I've put something in these computers which is very topical, very interesting, but I'm afraid it's all in English. So the children took a quick look at it and said, well, it's full of huge words and chemistry and diagrams and, you know, I mean, how can we possibly understand this? So I said, well, I've, I've thought about it and I don't think, uh, I, I mean, I don't know how you're going to understand anything, but I'll have to leave you now because, you know, there's no place in this village to stay. <laughs> so, so uh, you, know, you know what 12-year-olds do if you, if you do that sort of thing? They just go rushing to do whatever it is that you had said they can't do or uh, what. Uh, so, so, so I pushed off uh, and I came back after a couple of months. I had pre-tested them and the children had got close to a zero. When I came back, they again gathered together and uh, they were quite uh, silent and they said, we have understood nothing. So I thought, well, this is it. I mean, what else did I expect? So I said, well, what did you do? I mean, did you look at it once or twice and then just gave up? So they said, no, we look at it every day. So I said, why do you look at this every day if you don't understand anything? So this 12-year-old girl whose ribbon you can see, she raised her hand and in broken Tamil and English, she said to me, apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> so, so, you know, I learned, <laughs> I learned something else about this generation that is growing up, that the bars that they set for themselves are very high compared to the bars that we set we set for them. So when a child says, I haven't understood, don't take it too seriously. Uh, I post-tested them and got an educational impossibility. Zero to 30% in two months on their own. You know, just think of the context of a foreign language, 
an incredible subject that's at least 10 years ahead of where they are, uh, standing in the tropical heat with a couple of PCs <laughs> and uh, just by themselves. But it's not good enough because 30% is a fail. So how do I get them to pass? I can't get a biotechnology teacher there. What I did find was a young girl who was a good friend of the children. She's about 22, she was an accountant. And uh, I asked this girl, I said, can you help the children to learn a little more biotechnology? And she said, absolutely not. Because I didn't have any science in school. I have no idea what they're doing with that computer and what all those diagrams mean. I, I can't do this. So I said, well, you have to because there's nobody else. So you use the method of the grandmother. So she said, what's that? So I said, you know, stand behind the children. Every time they do anything, just say, that's fantastic. <laughs> How on earth did you do that? When I was your age, I couldn't have done anything like that. And so on. You know how grannies work, okay? Very different from, <laughs> very different from how mothers work, <laughs> all right? It, it, it's a switch that you need to remember. <laughs> the teacher's got to switch from being a mother to being a grandmother. And she did that, this girl, she did that very carefully for two more months. The scores jumped to 50%. Same as a control school in New Delhi, a posh private school in New Delhi with a trained biotechnology teacher. So it was stunning, absolutely. But it's all published now. Um, this had happened. So I knew by this time that there is a method lurking here somewhere which is very different from the way in which I was used to teaching. I came back to Newcastle with this statement then. Groups of children in the presence of a friendly but not necessarily knowledgeable mediator can learn anything by themselves. Okay? Well, <laughs> try it. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I know it's big. I know it's a huge statement to make. But, um, but I've seen it. I've seen it happen. So 2006 onwards, I started a whole set of experiments on stretching the limits of how far this can go. Firstly, I made an appeal in a British newspaper to say that if you are a British grandmother, if you have broadband and a web camera, can you give me one hour of your time per week for free? I got 200 in one week. I know more British grandmothers than <laughs> anybody else. You know? It is an exciting thing. <laughs> so, in the university, uh, these uh, 200 mostly retired, mostly female uh, teachers, uh, they are referred to as the granny cloud. So the granny cloud sits there on the internet. When there's a school in trouble anywhere on the planet, we beam a gran <laughs> over, over Skype. And she goes in there and fixes it. Okay? It works perfectly well. The retired teachers miss their children. The children love their British grannies. So when you just bring them together, things start happening. Skype is wonderful, it's free. So anyway you have broadband at home, you're paying for it. It's just one hour a week, and I have 200 hours of instruction available to me, top class stuff for nothing. So it's, it's worth developing that as a concept. Well, here's a look at how that whole method works. What you need are children. You need children in groups. You need the internet. You need the granny cloud if you yourself, the teacher, are for some reason not available. Otherwise, if you're there, then you, you can be the granny. And you need big questions. Remember, I, I started off by saying things that are interesting and not relevant. Well, 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds, they love those questions which are irrelevant, but highly interesting, okay? Um, you know, why are Vikings smelly? And that sort of thing. So you can push them towards any curricular direction that you want if you can engineer the right question. And here's what it all would look like. You can't catch me. You say it. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. Well done, very good, so we get.
other way about. Power of the supreme being. The word Durga in Sanskrit means a thought or a place which is difficult to... We went into Google and we typed in Leon. We went into Portal and we typed in Leonardo da Vinci. Wonderful. So, uh, this is pretty simple. It's pretty simple to organize. Children seem to enjoy it all the time. And I started trying this all over. Last year in Hong Kong, uh, one of your schools right here, uh, 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 one of the teachers created what is, I think, one of the best questions I have. Uh, he was teaching trigonometry. And, you know, children don't react very well to trigonometry. Uh, it's quite well known. So, <laughs> So what he did was, he created this question, how does an iPad know where it is? You, you say, where is my location? And the iPad tells you. So the children got to work. Remember, the method is that they get into groups of four. Each group of four can use one computer, not four computers. So I actually take away computers, because they're uh, discussing with each other is very, very important to the whole process. Uh, but they can discuss freely, they can walk about, and so on. So after about 30, 35 minutes, the children came back and said, um, it uses GPS. So I said, well, what's GPS? Uh, oh, the, it, uses about, it uses three satellites. So I said, why three? Why not one? Why not 23? So then they researched a little bit further and said, if you use one, you'll get a big circle in which you are. If you use two, you'll get a line where you are. And if you use three, you'll get a point of where you are. So I said, well, but how exactly does it calculate that point? So the children researched some more, and they said, we don't understand this. There's something called, you know, it's all trigonometry. So I said, well, would you like to know how the iPad actually calculates that point? And they said, yes. So then I told the math teacher, look, all that I've done is I've opened the door now. And you can go ahead and do your boring signs and cosines for the entire afternoon. <laughs> and they'll listen quite carefully because now they know why, why you're doing that. So the big question gives them a reason to focus. Montevideo, Uruguay. Well, this is a great question to try. Can trees think? And uh, you know, children get really turned on by it. It's, it's one of those highly interesting and very irrelevant questions. So they get very turned on and they say, well, trees, how can trees think? They don't have any brains. So I'd say, well, you know, check it out. And uh, well, I won't tell you the answer. You'll, you'll be very surprised what the answer really is. Uh, and I, uh, the Montevideo children told me. Santiago, Chile, in, again last year, where did language come from? I said, you know, we make twittering noises at each other and we understand what we are saying. Spanish, Portuguese, English, but the animals don't do that. Where, where does this come from? So they researched it for a while. These were nine-year-olds, Spanish-speaking. Then they said, words come from animal sounds. So I said, what's that? So they said, you know, things like oof and ouch. So I said, yeah, well, that makes sense. <laughs> you could convert them to words. Then they said, to make a sentence, you need more than one word, so you have to join the words together. And then they said, to join the words together, you need rules, and those rules are called grammar. When you have words and grammar, you have a language. And, you know, I was just, I, I was just flabbergasted at that coming out of nine-year-olds. So that kind of reasoning and that kind of thinking, can ha it won't happen individually. One nine-year-old sitting in front of one computer will never be able to do that. But give them four or five in groups, ask the groups to interact with each other, and you suddenly get this depth of, uh, depth of understanding. Turin, Italy, what did Pythagoras find? Well, they found Pythagoras' equation, but they didn't stop there. They went on to say that Pythagoras' equation leads to a thing called, for those of you who are science teachers, the Lorentz transformations, which in turn goes on into the theory, special theory of relativity. They did all this in 45 minutes, at which point the Italian teachers came back and, and they said to me, you know, sh shall we stop them? <laughs> it's, it's a strange question from a teacher, but I don't know what the answer is. Should you or should you not? Uh, they just go ahead. 
Washington, USA, very rowdy school. Uh, why does red go with black? So I said, you know, wear a red shirt with black trousers and that looks, you know, cool, real good, sexy. Why? Why not uh, purple with bottle green? Why doesn't that work? <laughs> so the children found the questions quite interesting and they got me the answer. And again, it's a strange answer. It's an answer buried inside uh, anthropology. And they found that in 45 minutes. Gates said, England, what are fractals? So of course, little boys and girls, they can't understand the mathematics of fractals, but they could fi figure out that these are shapes. Then they figured out that these are shapes which repeat themselves. So it's the same shape repeating over and over again. They got to up to that point. But what happened next was very interesting. One of the parents called and said, what exactly is happening in the mathematics class? So, uh, so the math teacher said, who I was working with said, well, uh, why do you ask? So she said, my little boy at breakfast, instead of eating his pineapple, said to me, mom, the skin of the pineapple is a fractal. Now that's very important because he was using something that is learnt in one context and transferring it to another context. And that's our definition of deep learning. So on the one hand, when we say, well, what does Google produce? Just tons of information. But it isn't doing that to the groups of children. It's converting itself into usable knowledge in groups with freedom. New Delhi, India, what are household robots? I asked this to, uh, this is a very poor school where most of the mothers are household uh, help in a uh, southeastern part of uh, Delhi. So I asked them this question because I wanted to see how they would react to the idea of a household cleaning robot. Well, firstly, they found the facts, robots are available. Then they said, they, uh, the government should really subsidize these and make it easy to buy. So I thought, wow, where's this coming from? I thought they would say these robots are going to you know, hurt my mother's profession. So why are they asking for it? So I said, why, why do you think they're so important? And they said, because then our mothers won't have to be maids. So, you know, the thinking was very di different from my adult point of view. So uh, just a simple question can trigger off this kind of a emotive response in, uh, if the question is right. Uh, just a few days ago, Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, again in a slum, I asked them uh, if, if anybody had had a dream, and one of the girls had had a big dream about jungles or whatever. So I then asked them, why do we dream? That was their, their question. They worked on it for about 45 minutes, and they came out with, uh, Professor Sigmund Freud has figured out a way to interpret dreams, said one group. The next group said, however, recent neurological data contradicts his findings. <laughs> At that point, I said, well, just relax. <laughs> well, here's what a, a, a typical self-organized learning session goes. Marvelous. The first step is to pose the question. You're all going to try and answer a really, really hard question. But the hard question has come from very, very far away. It hasn't come from me, and it hasn't come from Mr. Hall in the school. It hasn't even come from Sigartek from the university. All the way up there. Our question has come all the way from Australia, from right down at the bottom. What she'd done was she'd called a, a teacher in Australia over Skype. Luckily, he had written the question down because these Geordie children didn't understand a word of what he was saying. <laughs> Then we appoint two police officers to look after law and order. Questions on the board, off you go. And then they form their own groups and start working. And 
and the challenge for the teacher is to leave them alone because there's a lot of noise at this stage. After a while, it gets quiet as they begin to hit the right, right answers. And of course, there's the lawmaker to help out. So you give them about, uh, I generally give them about 45 minutes. And then each group makes a presentation of the answers. So when they make a presentation, at that point, finally, towards the end of your classroom session, you could, uh, you still don't value add, but you just put their answers together into a coherent picture. And whenever I've done this and tested, several months later, sometimes several years later, I find that they have absolutely perfect recall of the whole session. The way they remember is quite strange. They will tell you the fact, and then if you say, wow, how did you remember that? I say, you know, uh, Tom was fighting that day with Paul, and I went and sorted it out. They've connected it in their mind with something else that happened, and the fact is, is sort of frozen in. I don't know how exactly it works, but it's, it's, not, it's not rote, uh, learning of the variety that you, we would do from a book. It's something that was happening, and the facts are woven in with the activities that were going on in the room at that time, which they were all in control of. So that's, uh, that's probably how that mechanism works. So what does all of this mean? It means that if we had to define a new primary education curriculum, it looks as though what you need, first and foremost, is reading comprehension because all of this is dependent on the children being able to read what's on the screen. And also in terms of preparing them for the future, these are children who will be constantly reading things off screens throughout their lives. So they, for them to comprehend what they're reading is probably the most important. Followed by the ability to search and analyze information, which uh, these experiments show that they can do quite easily by themselves. But finally, there's a little problem. I haven't been able to solve it yet. If they can read, if they can search for information, read, put the facts together, convert it into knowledge, at what point should they believe and how? All of us have a little belief engine where eventually our experiential knowledge is converted into a belief. I don't mean doctrinal belief, I mean a, a factual belief. So the earth goes around the sun. Uh, we convert it to a belief. We don't say that this is because of two experiments done in Greece in so and so year. That's how we were convinced that it does indeed or, or that it is round. But we don't necessarily have to remember all those facts, we've converted it. How do you do that? I don't know. But the quicker we can teach children, how to find information, how to put it all together, and then form an opinion or a belief. The quicker we can do that, uh, the quicker we can leave them to deal with the world by themselves. That seems to be what the new generation requires at this point, this generation that is so completely inundated with information all the time. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. But I have, uh, you know, when I did these three, and presented it at all sorts of conferences, uh, one of the people who listened and spoke to me and eventually got me to the MIT was uh, Nicholas Negroponte. And uh, at that time, I was speculating, what if education was a self-organizing system where learning was an emergent outcome? So you just let it self-organize and wait until the learning happens. You, you don't, there's nothing else you can do. It's like gardening. You, you put the seeds there, you put the water, you allow the sunlight to come in, and you just wait until it happens. 
So when I was making that speculation, Negroponte raised a question. Um, this was his question. Can children learn to read by themselves? Because he said, if what I was saying is right, then if the answer to this question is yes, then primary education turns over on its head because you don't need anything else. So I don't know the answer to that. And what I'm doing is we're doing a set of experiments in India and Africa to try and find out with, Ill with illiterate children, to try and find out if children can learn to read by themselves with perhaps a, a tablet or a phone or something like that. And I think in the answer to that question will lie the future of learning. So that's the story, thanks. <laughs>